thanks for that kind introduction. I really appreciate uh, your attention today and letting me come talk to you. Uh, and I hope you won't be too disappointed because we're going to talk an awful lot about farmers and maybe less about birds than some of you might have expected. But, but we're balancing agriculture with birds, so we got to talk about farmers quite a bit to, to get that done. Uh, some of you may know, uh, even though Michigan did not historically have a lot of grasslands, uh, pretty much all we had uh, first got rolled over to make agricultural land. And then we kind of moved things around. Uh, we, we had about 7% grassland uh, in 1800. And that changes quite a bit. You know, we, we end up with the, the native grasslands, like this picture illustrates, uh, being converted into different kinds of agricultural uses. And then we have quite a lot of our tree canopy coming down to go into agriculture as well, which changes around the kind of the balance of grassland and forest land in the state. And this is kind of what we end up with. The, the grasslands that we have moved further north where other types of agriculture were not as prevalent. They're pretty widely spread out because at the time we're, we're still feeding a lot of horses on the farm, still feeding a lot of family milk cows. So there was a lot of need for a lot of hay. Um, what are we talking about when we talk about grasslands? There's a couple of different kinds we like to point out. Uh, short grass prairies and oak barrens tend to be on our, our dry, low fertility soils. There tends to be a lot of room between the plants, and this is a preferred habitat for some of our grassland birds. Um, tall grass prairies typically on, on heavier, more fertile soils. There tends to be less space between the plants, uh, taller and more dense plantings, and again, some of our birds prefer this as opposed to the short grass. Uh, and these wet prairies, or the wet areas in the prairies, often transition into wetlands and marshes, and that's where, uh, you know, from a grassland bird perspective, we get some nesting ducks and some other birds that are maybe occasionally nesting in the in the grasslands, maybe not as as needy of it as some of our others. Hey, there we go, no napping. Uh, and one of the reasons we get concerned about grassland birds in this context is because our crop fields mimic natural grasslands. And in many areas, our crop fields are the biggest portions of the land that, that are free of trees and other woody vegetation. And many of these, these birds are very adverse to woody vegetation. They just really won't tolerate very much of it at all. Um, Pastures are kind of an interesting thing to consider. They tend to be a little less intensively managed uh, they tend to have a little more diversity of plants to them, so they make pretty good wildlife habitat in general, and for our grassland birds, I think they're really an excellent uh, habitat. I spent quite a few years in Wisconsin uh, working with uh, grazing farmers, occasionally being a grazing farmer, um, and it, it was really quite amazing the populations of bobolinks and meadowlarks and, and birds like that that you would get on these fairly intensively managed pastures. Um, the other thing we tend to get is that the different kinds of livestock tend to eat different kinds of plants. Uh, goats, for example, are very fond of browse and broadleaves, where cattle are really more, more interested in eating grass. So depending on which kind of livestock we've got out there, we may get some different kinds of pasture composition over time. Um, these are just a couple of aerial photographs I put in to illustrate some of the challenges we're up against. Uh, this little farm here, this is my farm, uh, about 16 acres total. Um, and the first thing I did when I moved in there is I planted a windbreak because it's so god awful windy in West Michigan, especially you get out there toward the lake. And this is, I think this goes into a lot of our conservation planning. We're not necessarily thinking about these birds and we may do things that seem to make sense from an ecological environmental point of view, but that maybe are not the best thing for our grassland birds. And, and that's why these birds become so, so in, intense, of such intense interest to the different agencies that are trying to get uh, more, of this gra more of these grassland birds recovering. Um, even when we get into DNR properties, you can see we still get quite a lot of you know, patches here and there of trees, rows of trees along roads, patches of trees here and there. And there's just not enough money in the world for the DNR to get out there and, and convert some of these kind of scrublands or, or overgrown woody lands back into grasslands all at once. They do quite a lot of work on this stuff, but you know it, it's a constant battle to keep a grassland open in a, in a humid climate like ours where they tend to close up into trees. And 
I went to a lot of trouble to put bird songs in this presentation, but you'll probably barely be able to hear them. Say so, hello. Anyway, I just wanted to run through quickly some of the birds we're talking about, and I'm sure if, if some of you are serious ornithologists, there may be some quibbles about, you know, exactly whether these are grassland birds or not, but to start off, we've got some of our birds that really like the short grass, you know, the killdeer, we often see nesting along driveways, the nighthawks will even nest on flat roofs, uh, the horned lark, of course, many people are familiar with. Medium grass, you know, a little longer grass, you know, again, some of our more iconic birds, the eastern meadowlarks, the bobolinks, you know, somebody asked me if we have an upland sandpiper, there she is. Um, and actually, the, the, the three, three of the species up here were the most common ones we saw in the field when we were doing this work this year, the, the meadowlarks, the bobolinks, and the savannah sparrows, all appeared to be doing pretty well on the countryside when we were out doing our survey work. A few other birds, you know, you get into morning doves, morning dove, a grassland bird, you know, they show up now and then. Um, yeah, here's some more birds. You guys who came just to look at birds, you really ought to enjoy this part because we're going to switch to talking about farmers a lot. <laughs> And some of these species, you know, the red winged blackbirds, obviously, are doing very well. You see, you see a lot of them out in the countryside. Goldfinches are doing pretty well. There's our Henslow sparrow, from our, our charming anecdote at the beginning there. And we actually did, we did detect one bobwhite when we were out surveying our farms this year, and that was pretty darn exciting for some of us. Um, uh, one of the things I found as I've gotten out and started talking with people is, you know, yes, people are interested in songbirds, but I would say more people tend to be interested in some of these game animals when you're just out talking in general with farmers. So I, I, as this uh, project has progressed, I've really kind of pushed some of that stuff forward, and I think it's, it's important to engage these guys where they're at, and certainly a lot of them do like to hunt. Um, and a lot of them hunt deer. And so, and one of the pro aspects of this project, the flushing bars that we're going to talk about, do seem to be pretty effective at moving deer around also. So that's been a big one for us. And there actually is quite a lot of work going on in Michigan right now trying to get uh, breeding populations of pheasants recovered. Again, obviously a game animal, but one a lot of people are very, very interested in. And, and quite a beautiful animal, so I guess nothing wrong with that. Uh, as a group, beyond maybe the birds in Hawaii that have taken quite a whooping, uh, the grassland birds have probably declined more than any other group of birds. Uh, many have declined 40 to 70 percent, and there's a lot of factors that go into this decline. I don't think we can lay it all at the feet of agriculture, but certainly there's a lot to answer for there. Uh, a lot can be said about habitat fragmentation, and of course this goes on, you know, not only out in the countryside, but anytime there's a development, any kind of old field goes down, you know, we may see uh, habitats decline. Uh, some of our grassland birds really require very large blocks of, of open land, such as the upland sandpiper uh, here. Um, so even though we're, we're kind of programming at anything, we're, we're targeting anything bigger than 10 acres for, for getting those fields out there, but that's not going to be sufficient for some of these animals. And that's again why we see an awful lot of these birds attracted to our agricultural fields because they tend to be a lot bigger and a lot squarer than a lot of the other fields that they've got access to. Um, one of the things we've got to think about is that edges are, are where the predators are moving up and down generally. They like to move up and down those kind of, of brushy covered corridors. You know, and that's another reason to think about controlling some of this woody vegetation in any kind any time we're doing any work for grassland birds. You know, the predators are the usual suspects. Uh, you know, we, we've got the raccoons that had a banner year last year when we didn't have that cold winter. Um, unfortunately, a lot of our farms have way too many cats, and, you know, it's not always popular to tell the farmer you really ought to thin down the herd a little bit. Um, we sometimes see the brown-headed cowbird getting a lot of grief. I, I will point out in the defense of the cowbirds that they've been here for about a hundred 50,000 years and we didn't have a lot of problem before this so I guess I don't personally worry too much about the cowbirds and they do a wonderful job of picking bugs off of my cattle so I guess I don't get too upset with them. <laughs> and as I started thinking about this I started learning more and more about you know 
some of these environmental concepts. And one of them that really stuck out of me is this concept of the sink. The idea that not only is the species going to fail to reproduce, but they're actually going to go backwards because we're killing the adult animal, the adult breeding pair, or the adult breeding female, in addition to, to potentially wiping out uh, the offspring. So, and this, this is kind of building up to where the story goes. There's an awful lot said about farmers as if they're this kind of big monolithic block, and I really don't think anything could be further from the truth. There is a tremendous diversity among uh, agricultural producers, not only in size, but in attitude and, and in their level of management capability, how much time and effort they're gonna put into things like, uh, like the, the wildlife habitat around their farms. Um, and you guys are supposed to be laughing at this slide. This is much more than you would expect. And I went way out on a limb by making farmers a different species. So. But I, you know, they, I, I do think, I, I, I do get very, well I am and haw quite a bit when I start talking about farmers just because I don't want to give the impression that there's some kind of monolith out there that, that, that these guys aren't very diverse and, and have a lot of different thinking out there in the countryside. So what's happened on the farm? And, and how has that changed grassland birds? Uh, hay production has declined substantially from its height. Uh, we topped out at about two and a half million acres of hay and we're now under a million acres of hay. Why has that happened? Well, probably the biggest, the two big factors. Number one, we stopped using actual equine horsepower. We just didn't have the demand for hay that we had at, at the height of using horses for farming. Uh, and the horses we have still kicking around the countryside tend to stand around and not work for a living very much. So they just don't eat like those guys that had to really work for a living all the time. The other thing that happened is that dairy farmers and other cattle farmers discovered corn silage where they could grow out, go out and grow 20 tons of the acre forage. They got to harvest it once a year as opposed to when they're going out there and trying to harvest hay where the yield is somewhat lower and they've got to harvest three and four times to get the yield. So corn silage has gotten very popular as they finally figured out how to not kill cattle too quickly while feeding them a lot of corn silage. Um, we're also cutting hay more often and we're cutting it with faster equipment than we ever have in the past. Uh, the rise of a, a machine called the disc mower where instead of having a reciprocating blade, we've got a rotating blade. That's basically let the farmer go about two to three times as fast as they used to in the, in the field. And that, that can't be good for fleeing wildlife. And I, I finally, I collect yearbooks of agriculture, and I finally had a chance to actually get them out and make some use of them. So I actually went back to 1867, a uh, little after settlement, but not too long, and we've got about a million acres of hay at that point. By the time it peaks, we've got almost three million acres in 1948. Uh, 1948, well, World War II is kind of the break point where horses are decisively pushed off the farm as, as working animals, and we pretty much go to 100% tractors and different machines at that point. By 1978, we're starting to see the rise of corn silage, and by 2007, we're back to that million acres of hay. And it wouldn't surprise me if when we see the statistics coming out of the USDA, if that has dropped further, because the price of corn went bananas a few years ago, and an awful lot of hay got plowed up and put into corn. And you know, a funny thing happens, you know, a lot of unintended consequences is always out there. Price of hay this year, and I've actually got one of my farmers in the audience tonight, up 150% this year, 200%? Yeah, easily up, up that high with the drought and the freeze temp, freezing temperatures we had. So guys who hung onto their hay, they're pretty happy, reasonably happy. So how can we think about returning balance to agriculture in such a way that we can actually get out there, have the farmer make a good living, and still get some of these, some of these birds back on the farm doing a little better? Well, I got a, one of these conservation innovation grants, which comes from uh, a branch of the USDA called the Natural Resources Conservation Service. You know, they're basically the conservation guys on the federal level. They gave some money to the DNR a few years ago to work on this, and the DNR decided they didn't want to work on it for the third year, so they gave it to the Michigan Department of Agriculture and Rural Development, and they didn't know what to do with it, so they gave it to me. And I am nothing if not a, a kind of adventurous go-getter, so I said, sure, we'll try that. We'll see what we can do with that. So we're out there trying to figure out how can we make a bird-friendly forage production system. A lot of times I get from people, well, why don't we just cut later? 
that would do a lot of good, and that certainly is something we recommend to the farmers because you know basically those birds wrap up their breeding about the middle of July. If we could all not cut our hay until the middle of July, these birds would be doing fine. Well, we start running into a problem when we delay cutting. We, well, we get a couple of problems. Um, I'm going to show you two versions of this graph, but basically, as the as the plant is growing along here, it gets to the point where it starts to flower right about here. And you see the protein starts to drop, non-structural carbohydrates, that's a fancy way of saying sugars, that starts to drop like a stone. Lingon, which is the fraction of the, the hay crop that is basically indigestible by anything except soil fungi, begins to, go, begins to come up. And cellulose, which our ruminants can use as long as there's enough sugar in their diet to digest it properly, gets real high too. And basically, you get beyond here, you start to get into a kind of hay. We have a special term for this. We call this crap. <laughs> and, and there's only so much crap you can cram into animals and still get good production out of. You know, if you're getting up in here, you can throw a little more corn at them, essentially a, a source of, of other carbohydrates and sugar, and make some pro some progress on that. But this lingon's really a killer because you're filling up that rumen with something that's completely indigestible and isn't going to do you any good at all. So it's a big deal to ask these guys not to cut their hay in a timely manner. And now I'm going to talk about it again just to really, you know, emphasize it. This is kind of where your nutritionist tells you you want to be for making the optimum, optimum hay, right here at Bud. Well, that's end of May, beginning of June at the very latest. And you can push it out here a little bit, but you know, again, as you can see, a lot of this, the forage digestibility, that's kind of what I was explaining on the other graph, that really starts to drop off. Now, I actually have seen some things recently, guys start to rethink whether the animals can make some more, more and better use of this. And I certainly will be interested to see that, but you know, as a general rule of thumb, younger hay is better quality hay, period. Um, the other thing to consider is that the margins on our farm are really vary in how how good you do in a given year. Uh, during the height of the economic crisis, we pretty much had 18 months of money losing conditions for our dairy farmers, especially. They just got hammered, and it, you get these guys coming out of a situation like that where they've probably been eating their equity for two years, two and a half years. It's very difficult again to try to get them to make these kinds of changes that are going to cut into. There's some other reasons that, that it's hard to wait for a long time. A lot of guys store manure in these big lagoons. There's only so much storage capacity in there. And when that thing's full, it's full. And you got to go somewhere with it. And a lot of times they're going out on their hay ground in midsummer to get the, get the amount of their uh, manure pumped down in their storage. You know, there are some answers to that. You build a bigger manure pond. You know, you try not to put as much water in it. but. You know, it's like, it's like everything else that deals with food. When you gotta go, you gotta go. Um, there's also this issue of uniformity. This guy's a real big problem. This smiling man is a dairy nutritionist. I'm sure a fine fellow, but it really upsets him when you don't have a uniform diet to feed your cows. Um, another thing to think about with the dairy industry is you've taken an animal that was, at the turn of the 20th century, was milking maybe seven, 8,000 pounds a year. It's very common now to milk dairy cattle for 40,000 pounds of milk a year. Some of the top producers could be making 60, 70,000 pounds of milk a year. So these are real metabolic athletes, and you gotta push the groceries to those guys or they're not gonna make it. And it's not just a matter of production is going down. You can have problems with them uh, not rebreeding very well. You could have them get thin. Yeah, you basically have a drop of dead on you, which is always disappointing. So, being a raging pragmatist, I kind of started looking into, you know, how can we help the birds but not have to deal with these, these issues of forage quality quite so directly. Well, what can we do? Well, we can plan for a later harvest, and there's a couple of things we can consider. The first is warm season grasses, and this curve over here illustrates that the blue line is what's called a cool season grass, or it, it, it does what's called C3. Photosynthesis. They're really good at growing in the kind of the cool, wet times of the year. So they're they're really growing like crazy up in, in here. Maybe petering out in, in May. They drop off in the summertime, and then you get another little bump in the fall. 
the warm season grasses start growing like crazy in May. They peak here about June, July, so if we could get a lot more guys growing this stuff, we would probably be in a better shape for the birds just because we would naturally be cutting premium quality forage later in the year. Um, legumes are a little more forgiving uh, than, than grasses are. This is why we grow so much alfalfa in this country. Um, and we may be able to push them out uh, a little further. Nice thing about legumes is they also make free nitrogen. Nitrogen is actually about 25% of the entire production and agriculture energy budget. We use a tremendous amount of natural gas to make artificial nitrogen in this country. If we could do, do it with more legumes, you know, that would probably be better for everybody's global energy balance. We can think about maturity dates within a, a given species, and this is a little hard to read, but basically the spread you see uh, on each of these uh, peaks is between the earliest and the latest maturing varieties of a couple of different common uh, agronomic species. And you can see there's almost three weeks there. So if we can plant the absolute latest maturing variety of a given species we want to grow, that's certainly helpful. We can change how we mow. The traditional pattern uh, that, that we all learned from our forefathers is you mow around the outside once, and then you turn around, you go back the other way, and you mow around and around and around and around, and you make this last pass here, and all the critters have kind of gotten concentrated in the middle of the field, and you can really wipe them out in a big way. If we could get our fellas to get in there, open the field up from the middle, and work their way out, or kind of spiral out from the middle, this, this looks like a recipe for getting really dizzy to me, but <laughs> this one here, I, I think, it might be kind of doable, and we certainly have seen some of our guys trying that, doesn't seem to cost them anymore. I, and I, I think it will help. I'm not sure how much it will help, but it can't hurt. And it's easy, so it's certainly one we talk about quite a bit. Certainly encourage guys to not mow at night. Uh, you know, any of you who've worked with birds know they get pretty darn sticky at night and they really don't want to move hardly at all. Um, the other aspect is from, from a farming perspective, if once the sun goes down, the plants quit making sugar and they start respiring. And especially during the hot parts of the summer, within a couple of hours, the level of free sugar bouncing around in that crop is, is going to drop pretty substantially. So, you know, that's, that's a good reason to try to mow while the sun is shining. Um, this is an interesting one that I would love to see some people try, and that's to mow the first crop of hay very early before the breeding season starts, and then to come back and mow the second crop just as late as they can. A lot of our grasses typically, if they, once they flower once, they won't tend to flower again. And it's really the production of flowers that drives that steep decline in quality. So uh, this would be an interesting to see, one to see. I've not been able to find any uh, academic publications on this, but it's one somebody bounced off me, and boy, that, that certainly sounded interesting. This is kind of what I latched onto in a big way uh, with this project, uh, and that's to slow down and use something called a flushing bar. And a flushing bar is just a simple tool that drags some chains through the forage ahead of the hay mower so that the birds can get up and out of the way. And you know, you, you run this by people, and I get two reactions. Wow, that's really simple. I could build that. And you look at that one. There's a two by four piece of chain, a couple of chains there. I think that's that's about a two hour job in the shop if I'm drinking beer. Maybe an hour and a half if I'm not. Um, of course, being working for the government, I made a much more complex version of that. And actually, one of my farmers is here tonight. And it it had some challenges, and we're working on a generation two. But the the concept's pretty simple, and I'm I'm pretty excited about the potential of this tool, especially with our older slower mowers. This is the old sickle bar type. It's trailing behind the tractor, so there's a fairly substantial amount of room from where they're going to get hit with that flushing bar to where they, the deadly blades are at. This is kind of a, this is just a structural drawing of, of what we started with when we started building flushing bars. This is from Ducks Unlimited Canada. Uh, and it's pretty simple, you know, you've got a boom you can fold down here, a little pivot point in the middle so you can fold it in half and stand it up for going down the road. We chose to add a little pivot point here in order to give it some breakaway protection. I was a little concerned that the first time you clocked something out here, you'd bend the dickens out of this thing and you'd, you'd be done for the season and this would just be, you know, scrap metal. 
So we chose to build a little different mounting system. This is what's called a quick attach plate. That mounts directly on the front end loader of a tractor uh, and holds it really firmly in place. Uh, we ended up actually adding two chains here and a spreader in order to try to keep the bars centered. And that was where we had a little trouble. It tended to want to wander around a little more than uh, some of our farmers like. But we're, we're working away on that. And Bill, I feel bad. You were right there until this afternoon, and I replaced you with one of my other pictures. I don't know what the heck I was thinking. You were the one who was going to show up anyway. But this is kind of this is the, the flushing bar. I think turned out the best of the lot. Uh, this is a little different mounting system because it's a John Deere, and they've always got to be special. Um, but we actually put the put the mounting. Uh, the mass carrier right down on the ground so it was a little more stable and used a little heavier plate. And that solved some of our problems. Um, this is what I'm working on now. This is generation two where we actually slid the, the uh, mass holder a little further to the center of the uh, machine so it's a little more stable. And then we're going to come out here and the bar will go this way. So I think generation two is going to be better. And I will cut yours up and fix it like this if you want because I like welding and playing with torches. One of the other problems we're up against when we start thinking about flushing bars is we've got a lot of other different kinds of mowers out there than that traditional one we started with. This is a 16 foot wide John Deere self-propelled mower. It's got a disc mowing unit in it so it can go about 15 miles an hour and obviously there is no room between, you know, to hang that bar. I have been talking to one fellow about trying to put about an eight foot fiberglass pole here, fiberglass bar out front just to keep the weight down and hang some chains off of here. And I had a young man agree to try to do it until he asked his dad and then that was the end of that. So we're, this is still something I'd like to see somebody try, but in about three days this grant's gonna be over, so I'm not sure it's gonna be me and it's not gonna be this year. Um, We've got some other mower configurations coming along. This is a Kloss Cougar. That thing goes about 15 miles an hour, mows 48 feet at a crack. And it's, it's really quite amazing. I'm, I'm kind of like a little kid with this farm equipment stuff. I just feel you know, bigger, badder. Ah, it's exciting, but if I was a bird, that's scary. Um, however, I, I look at this thing and I actually think, you know, you've got a little bit more to work with. A couple bars off here to flush for these decks, and a couple bars here to flush for that deck. You know, I don't know, it's a German piece of equipment. I couldn't get the Germans to return my phone calls to ask how to do it, but we're thinking about it anyway. This is another kind of up and coming con uh, configuration one mower deck on the front of the tractor with one off to each side. And again, I think it wouldn't be, it's not too hard to imagine you could at least flush for the two rear decks just by mounting something on that front deck. So I guess my, my take home message is on this, even though the, the technology is changing to some different kinds of mowing technologies, I think if we could popularize this concept and make it something that the guys could work from the tractor seat, it might be possible. And I, I would love to see somebody, uh, yeah, give me some more money to try that. That would be swell. Or get the Germans to figure it out themselves. That'd be super too. The other big thing that I think we can promote among our farmers is to start thinking about grass farming with some seriousness. And it's, it's a movement that really took off and was really big in Wisconsin when I was over there, so I really got pretty excited about it there. And even though it, it does not really, it does not by any stretch of the imagination represent the majority of dairy farms, the nice thing about Wisconsin and New Zealand and some of the other places where this is big in the world is they certainly demonstrate you can do it on a large scale and that you can make lots of money doing it. And the reason is that even though we're not getting as much milk out of these animals, we don't put nearly as much money into, the, in, into getting the milk we do get out of them, and we don't kill them nearly as quickly. And I, I could go on and on about how easy it is to kill dairy cattle, but that's maybe another talk. Um, management intensive grazing is, is one of the terms we use for it, rotational grazing, you know, whatever. You know, basically the idea being that you break your, your grassland up for your farm into something on the order of 15 to 30 paddocks or sub-pastures and you rotate them around through the pastures and that allows the grass to have time to recover and, and grow a, a sufficient and good crop. Um, 
I have been on grass farms, on grass-based dairy farms with 2,000 cows. I've been on grass-based dairy farms with 20 cows. It's pretty scale neutral, and I, I'd really be excited if we could see some more action on this front. Um, New Zealand's really where this type of farming became, became kind of a world beater. I'm sure you know New Zealand is kind of globally in the middle of nowhere. Um, and it's, it's a very heavily agricultural country, so they make a whole lot of uh, milk concentrate powder and some other kind of industrial products from the milk, and they ship it all over the world. I will guarantee you, you have eaten New Zealand milk protein at some point. Uh, their cost of production per hundredweight is something like eight, nine dollars. In this country, it's more like 17, 18 dollars. So the cost of production under this system can be very reasonable for, for what you get. And as you can see, pretty big farms. Um, I think I'm going the wrong way. Maybe I am. Yes, I am. There we go. One of the other advantages, uh, certainly there, there's some things that uh, kill cows, one's called a displaced abomasum, where one of those four stomachs it's got gets a little twisted and off to one side. Uh, laminitis, which is where the feet go to heck on them, or, or it should be called delaminitis because the feet delaminate, and it's, it's caused a lot of times by trying to feed cattle too little forage. Remember how they discovered that corn silage years ago? This is kind of a ragged edge the modern dairy farm runs on. How much corn silage can I feed them before I blow the feed out on them? that happy guy who was mixing up the forage who gets up unhappy when you change things around. This is why he does not want any variation in his forage because it is pretty easy to mess dairy cattle up if you're, if you're not paying attention to how you feed them. Um, management intensive grazing has been shown to be more consistently profitable than these other methods of farming. And you know, there's, there's a lot of good examples out there globally to figure it out. Totally going the wrong way. Yeah, and this is just kind of my slide about how much more profitable it is and why. You know, basically with a with a grass-based farm, you're going to keep about a quarter of every dollar that goes through the farm. It's more like 15 cents with a more conventional farm. And the other thing I guess I will say about it is there certainly is room for kind of hybridizing these farms, and in fact, some of the most successful of these grass-based farms I saw do throw a little corn silage at the cattle every day. They do, they do feed them fairly aggressively. They just make them get their forage out there by walking around and getting it done that way. There we go. <laughs> and the existing infrastructure on farms is also usually very amenable to, to doing uh, this kind of grazing. This is a center pivot irrigator. It's one of the more expensive toys that guys buy these days for, for applying irrigation water. It's certainly possible to set up a farm to use things like center pivot irrigators, large farming kind of infrastructure. It's actually very important to have an excellent milking parlor. You got to get them in and out in two hours, period. You got 2,000 cows, you better have a you know, you better have a, something like one of these rotary milking parlors. This thing goes round and round. The cows get on here and they kind of go around here while they're being milked. And then they get off on the other end. It's like a big barrier around for cows. And you can milk them pretty fast. And there's some other things that are real advantages. It, it, lower entry costs. I cannot emphasize how much money it takes to get into farming if you don't have the good sense to inherit it from your dad. It just, it's, it's tremendously expensive. Not only do you have to buy land, it's, it's frequently land, equipment, and cattle are all about the same price, you know, as far as a block of money you gotta lay your hands on. Um, it's more stable, in, typically, because you're growing a perennial crop that's there year after year. You're not out there trying to annually hammer in your corn and get these things done. I call it kid-friendlier, uh, you know, the, uh, the American farm is among the most dangerous workplaces in the country. We haven't quite caught up with coal mining yet or fishing, but you know, beyond those two, we're we're, we're pretty good contender for, for a place to get injured or killed. And well, you got to watch out for the kids on the farm. They like to get out and about, and they're a whole lot like less likely to get run over by a cow than they are a tractor. Uh, there are some unique marketing opportunities. You know, our little farm. Yeah, 
market's grass-fed beef. You know, we don't feed them a stitch of corn, we just feed them grass. And there are more and more marketing opportunities all, got, all the time. This smiling guy on the bottom is Mike Gingrich. He's a guy I know in Wisconsin. Uh, he and another fellow, Dan Patton, have partnered to make themselves a little grass-based dairy. Dan ran the farm end of it. Mike here made the cheese. He's smiling because that cheese sells for 25 bucks a pound. And the first year he made this cheese, he won some great, big, glorious prize for it. And he's been making money hand over fist ever since. And he is, he is one of the most genuinely happy guys in agriculture I know. And of course, the soil erosion under grass is pretty much nothing. CS, the federal guys who funded my project, they actually have quite a lot of money available to help farmers uh, change how they farm, and they love this pasture thing because it knocks the soil erosion down to nothing. Um, so it's been a big emphasis of theirs for a number of years. Um, unfortunately, farm bill programming is kind of a moving target, so at any given time, you know, something may be off the table or not, but pretty much year in and year out, they're pretty excited to do these pasture projects. Uh, there's another project called Grassland Reserve Program, which will actually buy an easement from farmers to guarantee that it stays in grass or hay. And the Conservation Reserve Program is there to actually set aside highly erodible land permanently or, or for 10 to 15 years ago. So there's, there's lots of support for that. Let's get back to birds, this being Audubon, not a bad idea. Um, a grazing animal is obviously much less threatening to these birds than a big mower that's going to go through and you know, sickle bar off everything in a field. And in fact, one of the greatest things I ever saw was a pasture walk at Harley Traster's house when these bird, when the bobolinks were attacking these 1,400 pound Holsteins and driving them away from their nests. <laughs> And if there's anything funnier than watching a male bobble like sitting on the head of a cow driving it away, I really don't know what it is. Maybe it's just the bird or me, but it was really, really cool. Um, nonetheless, not a bad idea to leave some refuge areas, uh, deferred grazing if you can. Uh, you know, again, you're up against that forage curve, so you got to be careful with that. Um, but I think because the, the birds will defend the nest and because they're, they're much more capable of fleeing from a cow than they are from these mowers, I think you could probably get in there and graze earlier than you could hay and still do well for the birds. And certainly, anecdotally, I saw tremendous numbers of birds on these grazing farms, you know, year in, year out. And even my little farm with only 10 acres, I know I had a pair of bobolinks and I know I had a pair of meadowlarks in my pasture this year. Seemed to have a pretty good year. They were around for quite a while. Um, where we might rest, and you know, this is kind of a good example. You know, you might pick something where you've got a pasture. You might pick, you know, where you got a pond. Where if you were looking for some ducks or something like that. Um, and the other thing that may be a good consideration is pick an area next to some of your row crops where you know, some of these birds may be pushed out of that, but at least there's not woody vegetation and they may be nested there. So. Anyway, that's what I had for you tonight. Um, it's been really a pleasure doing this grant and you know, to, to work with farmers who are really passionate about how they, how they manage their land, why they manage their land. You know, it's not all about the bucks or some of these guys. Uh, Bill, who's here tonight, has just been a tremendous partner on some of this, as have the other four guys uh, we've worked with this year. So just really can't thank them enough. And you know, I, I guess I feel like our farmers get a bad rap sometimes. And you know, I, I can tell you the good guys are still out there. Although sometimes they're a little hard to find. It was a complete fluke that I found Bill. I stopped by to ask about buying a piece of equipment and talked him into being a good cooperator with me. So. <laughs> Kismet, I guess. I'll stop getting all misty up here. <laughs> Anyhow, any questions tonight? We got a mic up here if you if you want it or just holler. Wake up. I'll try to holler. Sure. Can you hear me? Yep. Well, I'd like to understand a little bit more about how you've done this and where you've done it. You're from Allegheny County, right? Have you contacted from Justin Allegheny County? 
No, I worked primarily out of Allegan County and adjacent counties. Uh, I got as far south as Cass County. Um, all right, Cass, Van Buren, Allegan. I think that's it. And we certainly did outreach throughout the state. I, I gave this talk at the Great Lakes Forge Conference this year, and, you know, and, and did a table at a couple other uh, conferences this year, and talked directly with farmers. And it, it, it was pretty nice to, to just to talk to these guys, because a lot of them were. I, I guess the most common answer I got when I introduced the concept of the flushing bar was, "That looks easy. I could build that out." And I got laying around the farm. It was especially handy when their wives were there to kind of, <laughs> you could build that. So I'm hoping more of them got built than just the ones I built. And so, will your ideas be promoted, for example, in Kent County, by anyone, or what will happen now? Yes. Um, we, keep, we do maintain this website, flushingbarproject.net, um, and that'll, we're going to keep that going as long as I'm working at the district, I'll guarantee you that. Um, so the, the information that we've gathered up about maybe some of the modern mounting ideas and things like that will, will continue to be disseminated. Uh, Michigan Natural Features Inventory is actually working on some new materials, and I'm going to write the flushing bar portion of that for them. So I, I, th I think the concept's going to be out there. But, you know, frankly, the, the idea of the flushing bar, as far as I can tell, goes back just about as far as mechanical mowers. I found, you know, a uh, WPA, uh, Works Project Administration, poster for the Pennsylvania Game Commission where there's a picture of a flushing bar hanging off the, the horse collar in front of a horse mower. So it, it's not a new concept, you know, why it has not caught on as much in this area, I, I don't know. Uh, it seems to have caught on more in some places out west where maybe they were doing a little more grass-based farming for a longer time. An ecological sink is just a situation where, in addition to failing to reproduce, you'll actually lose adult breeding animals. So the idea being essentially that, well, and maybe someone with more letters after their name would be able to explain it better. But my understanding of it is that in addition to being a, a, a poor area to reproduce in, it's got the potential to also actually make the population go backwards by killing the breeding adult. And you, you've had a second term we wanted. Uh, mortality decomposition. Mortality decomposition. Yeah, it sounds like rotting corpses would be mortality <laughs> decomposition. <laughs> yeah, yeah, stump me on that one. Yes, sir. I noticed on one of your slides the approximate size of dairy farms in New Zealand was around 400 cows. Yes. Is that not a low-end trend for dairy farms in Michigan? Uh, I would guess if you average them, you might come out with something close to that. Um, Is that we a trend, though, to larger? Oh no, I, absolutely. The trend is absolutely toward bigger bigger dairy farms, bigger farms of all kinds. Would they will they is there any reason to suspect that they would be willing to be more cooperative in moving towards pasture rather than silo feeding their animals? I think it's a hard sell with I think trying to convert these guys to grass farming is a hard sell no matter what size they are. And I think it's got more to do with the with the imagination of the farmer than necessarily anything else. You know, if you you, you could put a bunch of information in front of them that says this is more profitable. So and, you're and saying it, so you're saying that that they are going to be stubborn, hard-headed rather than that there seems to be a lot of benefits of the New Zealand. Approach is taken that would be beneficial to the farmer. Yeah, my my approach, frankly, has been to encourage farmers to think about a hybrid system. Uh, on, on a typical dairy farm, 
you've essentially got three groups of adult cattle. You've got dry cows, and the cows dry for about 60 days a year. There's no reason to keep that cow in the building. None. You know, you don't have to milk her. It'll be better for her if she was off of concrete. I mean, concrete is what really tears up their feet as much as anything else. Typically, there will be a high group and a low group, depending on where they are in their lactation. Uh, typical lactation is about 300 days. Um, first 200, 220 days of that, they're milking along pretty, pretty strongly, but that starts to taper off toward the end. Again, that low group should be going outside, and that would, I think, have a lot of health benefits for those cattle. You know, you might be able to milk those cows once a day instead of twice a day as part of, you know, stepping down their lactation. So there certainly are things that any farm could do. Even just keeping their young stock on pasture would make a big difference. They come into production with better feet and legs. You know, they wouldn't already be two years behind the eight ball on concrete, and they'd be cheaper. Now, that, you could tell all of that to the guy, and he's going to turn around and he's going to go, I just spent a million bucks putting that barn up to put my young stock in. You know, why the heck? You pointy-headed little government man. What I want to not use that building I just spent all that money on. And he's got a, he's got a point. He's got a point. And, they, you know, a lot of these farms have a tremendous amount of infrastructure built onto them. A lot of times, the placement of the central of the farm is not real good. If you're going to have a grass farm and you're going to milk cattle on it, you really want to put the facility as close to smack in the middle of your block of land as you can. Right, and, and work around the outsides. You know, if you've got a headquarters where you're essentially cut off from your, your land base, you know, what are you going to do? So it's, it, it is a tough nut to crack, absolutely. Zealand is a very good example, though, to be able to try to implement that. Material. Yeah, but those guys never, they never built the barn. You know, they, they uh, you know, in New Zealand, typical farm is there's a milking parlor, and they might have a wet weather pad someplace where they can pull them off, but, you know, there's not a great big freestall barn generally. So right. it's, it is, it is a real different situation out there. Yes, sir. Is there any um, incentive by government or otherwise to just set aside land to be fallow for birds? Yes, uh, there's a couple of them actually. The Conservation Reserve Program is a good one, and that is typically uh, that that's a 10 or 15 year contract to set aside a block of land. Uh, typically, it's going to have to have something. I don't want to say wrong with it, but it, it's, there's typically a preference for land with greater slope or land that's otherwise, you know, impaired for agriculture. Now, you know, it's depending on the year, depending on how many people are interested in signing up, some of those those criteria may move around a little. And what's been interesting the past couple of years is to see how much CRP land has come out of CRP and gone back into production because the price of corn has gotten so high that even if even land that yielded relatively marginally, you know, a three dollar corn wasn't worth farming. And eight dollar corn, it's a whole different ball game. You know, and we've seen not only a tremendous amount of CRP come out, but just fallow ground. You know, kind of scrub land, the old fields that, that were not in good shape. You know, the yellow equipment came out and all that stuff got piled up and burned and the corn sprouted again, so it's it's a very interesting time in agriculture right now. Very interesting. <laughs>